Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, hello everybody, I'm Zainab Badawi and welcome to this Finance in Common Summit, which is of course part of the Paris Peace Forum and I am delighted to be hosting this high level event on accelerating investment for climate adaptation and resilience. And um, this is really a first because of course we're bringing together the 450 global public development banks, be they national, regional or international, and really highlighting their role at this very critical stage um, of the world's development mm -hmm. as marked the historic landmark okay. agreement of the Paris Agreement from five years ago. And um, we really want to put the spotlight on the role that the PDBs can play in accelerating climate and adaptation action. And as though we needed any reminding of the urgency of this, we've had the tragic landslides in Guatemala and the floods in the Philippines. So no time to waste. We've got just under an hour. It's going to be a packed 50 minutes. We have videos. We have a wonderful panel and a keynote speech from the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon. Hello to you, Mr. Ban in Seoul, where I know it's rather late, so I should say good evening. But we're going to kick off this high-level event with a film about five or six minutes, which is going to feature the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amina J. Mohammed, who's really going to be making the case for accelerating action and investment on adaptation and resilience. So please, team, would you be so kind as to roll the video? Thank you. Rising sea levels, acidic oceans, heavy storms and flooding, higher temperatures, wildfires, desertification, our weather is more extreme and unpredictable. Taking urgent steps to reduce global warming is critical. But the United Nations says greater action is also needed to increase financing and investment in adaptation and resilience. The last decade was the hottest on record. Indeed, the last five years each set new record highs, each year surpassing the previous one. While the early pandemic response caused a temporary drop in carbon pollution, emissions have since returned to pre-COVID levels and climate destruction has continued apace. The world is way off track to meet the goal of the Paris Agreement to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. At just one degree of warming today, we are witnessing unprecedented climate extremes on every continent. Climate-related disasters nearly doubled over the last two decades, with the number of major floods more than doubling and the incidence of major storms growing too. Those who have contributed least to the problem, the poorest and the most vulnerable, stand on the front lines of the climate crisis and bear the impacts disproportionately. We now face a paradoxical world in which populism and anti-migrant feeling is surging but in which hundreds upon millions of climate migrants in the near future is a near certainty. Yet, investments in adaptation and resilient measures represent a mere 20% of total international climate finance flows. Your leadership is required on four important fronts to accelerate financing for adaptation and resilience. First, financing for adaptation and resilience must be delivered at the scale demanded by science and the needs of the most vulnerable. Second, climate risks and opportunities must be taken into account in all financial and policy decisions and at all levels. Third, portfolios currently favour disaster relief and this needs to change. We must move from a small scale adaptation finance triggered by catastrophes to proactive, preventive and systematic adaptation support through substantial concessional finance at scale public and private finance must also be aligned in this effort. Finally, we must ensure that those most in need, small island states, least developed countries and African nations, are assured of simplified and timely access to available resources. As highlighted by leaders gathered to discuss financing for development in the era of COVID-19 and beyond on September the 29th, 
the recovery from the crisis represents a unique opportunity to accelerate the shift towards a low carbon, climate resilient future. This means aligning recovery plans with climate goals as expressed in nationally determined contributions, national adaptation plans, and frameworks and strategies to get to net zero emissions by 2050, and to investing in low carbon growth and generating the jobs we need to transition to this new world, such as infrastructure and energy efficiency. Scaling up adaptation and resilience finance will require all financial flows to align with these imperatives, national budgets, national regional and multilateral development banks, climate funds and private finance. Implementing innovative financing models such as debt for climate and debt for adaptation swaps will also be key to these efforts. Only then can we level the playing field to ensure investments towards the recovery are all climate resilient. And only then will we give everyone an equal chance to build back better regardless of the storms, both figurative and literal, that will surely come. We count on your support and leadership. We have absolutely no time to waste. <coughs> the world needs to prevent, <coughs> protect and recover. Now is the time for deeper and sustained collaboration by governments, international finance institutions and the private sector to accelerate adaptation and resilience. So, a real rallying cry there from the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amina J. Mohammed. Well, um, it's now my great pleasure to invite the uh, former Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki moon, who, of course, was in that post from 2007 to 2016, and he's now the current a chair of the Global Centre on Adaptation, amongst so many other things that you are doing, Mr. Ban Ki moon, uh, very, very active since you left the United Nations. And you're going to be making uh, for us really the strategic case for adaptation in addition to mitigation. They are two sides of the same coin. So please, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Miss China Padawi. It's a great pleasure to see you again. Thank you for your commitment in working with the United Nations and other key leaders on climate change still uh, Mesdames and Messieurs, uh, dear participants, it's a great uh, pleasure to be part of you. Uh, bonjour, bonsoir from Seoul. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, His Excellency President Emmanuel Macron and AFT CEO uh, Remy Hill, a good friend of mine, for initiating this summit at such an important time. It couldn't to come at a more crucial time uh, as we discuss the sustainable ways to rescue the global economy. I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate Anne-Marie Travelian, thank you, uh, on her new role as the UK's international champion on adaptation and resilience for COP26 summit, an important role at an important time. In fact, a uh, couple of weeks ago, I met uh, Minister Alok Sharma in Seoul and discussed about how we can work together uh, for the successful uh, achievement of uh, Glasgow mm -hmm. COP26. National leaders are increasingly promising a green industrial revolution to drive their economies post-COVID recovery. They are right in believing we cannot go back to our bad old ways. COVID-19 should not have come as a surprise. The world was warned of the risks arising from the loss of bio biodiversity and climate change. Other threats, most notably our climate emergency, have not gone away during the pandemic. The pandemic and COVID-19 are two sides of just one coin. If we address properly climate change, we would not have this um, uh, pandemic. It is clear we need to build our society's resilience to emergencies of all kinds. Our current planning and 
preparation for viruses, for rising seas and other effects of climate change are not enough. It's becoming increasingly clear that in many parts of the world, our environment has al already changed and we need to change with it. Mitigation and adaptation, and they are two, two ways of uh, addressing this climate change uh, policy responses, but they should go hand in hand together. There are two equally important building blocks of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, the world's peace pact with the planet. The Paris Agreement gives us direction and clarity. Uh, it gives a specific measurable goals with a clear roadmap to achieve these. We now need to redouble our efforts before we pass the point of no return. We must do everything possible to protect lives and livelihoods by finding and spreading the word that practical and positive solutions. Solutions for communities, farms, and businesses. As the chair of the Global Center on Adaptation, <coughs> led by CEO Patrick Faircoyen, we exist to ensure heads of state and government, the ministers, the business executives, and investors work with the scientists and the innovators and people working on the ground. With these partners, we find, we finance and design ways uh, to help those in areas most at risk from climate change. We are a solutions broker. Public Development Bank also have a special role and responsibility in the financial system to help finance these solutions. Let me tell you, the economics of adaptation are compelling. Creating new infrastructure, such as buildings and road that is resilient to climate change can stand up to extreme conditions and reduce the impact of its effect as relatively little to the total cost. Only about 3% extra. And according to a recent World Bank report, that extra 3% investment will be offset by savings up to four times the cost of the loss and damage that would have occurred without it. So with that in mind, between now and say uh, 2030, one trillion dollars in incremental uh, investment in more resilient infrastructures would eventually generate more than four trillion dollars in benefit. That means uh, four times. In flood risk areas, early warning systems to a lot communities can save thousands of lives and billions of dollars a year in losses. The more warning there is, particularly where communications have to reach those in remote areas, the less damage and loss results. People have a chance to move themselves and their property out of harm's way. It is estimated that a 24 hour warning in advance can reduce damage by 30% and 48 hours advance warning, 50%, 50%. Investing in restoration to repair, replant and strengthen river watershed could save some of the world's largest cities on estimated 890 million people, dollars, 890 million dollars every year by reducing the risk of flooding. The value of the benefits can be many, many times higher than the cost of implementing the technology in the first place. The facts are there for us all to see. But despite the compelling economic case for 
working to reduce risk, working to accelerate adaptation isn't happening fast enough. In the run-up to next year's COP26, I hope we will see greater political ambition, tools, finance, coordination, and commitment to support greater adaptation and resilience. Today's event is a key milestone leading to January's Climate Adaptation Summit hosted by the Netherlands, which I will co-chair with the Prime Minister Mark Rutte on January 25th next year. But so much more needs to be done. Holding us to account, I applaud the energy and focus of young people around the world demanding faster and more meaningful action. And I'm pleased, I'm pleased to see them represented on today's panel. We all have a part to play because no one can fight climate change alone. Climate change does not respect borders. It's an international problem that can only be solved with the cooperation, collaboration across borders and worldwide. That means we have to forge a global uh, partnership. That's, uh, that's the key to address this climate uh, crisis. We must do what needs to be done while we still have time. Thank you very much, Maxi. Thank you so much indeed. Um, there is the uh, former Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, really setting out the, um, the case in um, unequivocal terms and um, in, as always with your elegance and um, great articulacy and eloquence. Thank you so much, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. And of course, as chair of the um, Global Centre on Adaptation, calling for a revolution in understanding, a revolution in planning and a revolution in finance when it comes to this issue of adaptation and resilience. We know it's late in Seoul, sir, so thank you very much indeed. I know you have other pressing commitments to attend to. Thank you so much. So we thank now you. have I a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so thank much. You. Bye -bye. See you thank very you. soon, I hope. Bye -bye. Thank you. Great. Hope to see you again. Yeah, thank you. Good. So we now have um, our panel and we're going to um, just really discuss these elements a little bit more that we've heard um, so far. And we have Nick O'Donoghue, who is Chief Executive Officer of the CDC Group. Hello to you, Nick. And also we have Nisreen al Saim, who joins us from the Sudan because she is chair of the Sudan Youth Organization on Climate Change. And Nisreen, you are also the chair of the current Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change. And you're also going to be part of the African Negotiators on Climate Change in COP26. So, Ahlan wa sahlan, assalamu alaikum to you in, um, in the Sudan. And Anne-Marie Trevelyan. Conservative British MP, who is uh, currently the UK International Champion for Adaptation mm -hmm. and Resilience COP26. And she says it's such a long title, but a very worthwhile one, Anne-Marie Trevelyan. And of course, as um, we all know, Anne-Marie was um, Secretary of State for the Department for International Development in the Cabinet until this autumn when there was the reorganisation in the British government. So um, welcome to you also, Anne-Marie. So Anne-Marie, um, let's kick off with you because all eyes are on the United Kingdom, of course, because COP presidency and um, you're also part of this uh, very, very critical, critical team. So just Outline for us, please, what are the United Kingdom's priorities on adaptation and resilience? Because we hear a lot about mitigation, but as you heard Ban Ki Moon there say, it is equally as important, A and R, adaptation, resilience, your priorities. Thank you, Zainab. And yes, I think Ban Ki Moon uh, set it out incredibly well. The case for A and R uh, is genuinely urgent. And I think the pandemic has highlighted the need for resilience for all of us, every nation across the globe, we've been challenged in health resilience, but I think it highlights uh, the uh, fact that this affects all of us and climate change is a very, very real and present threat. There are 100 million people at risk of being pushed into poverty by climate change by 2030. And the adaptation costs in developing countries is expected to be somewhere between 140 billion and 300 billion US dollars annually by 2030. 
So we've got three key priorities for ANR for COP26. Uh, firstly, really driving action on the ground to improve adaptation and to minimise and address those loss and damage questions. Secondly, and critically, of course, increasing the amount of and access to finance, especially for those small island states, for developing countries for whom this has been a, a difficult challenge to address in the past. And thirdly, improving protection from climate related disasters by tracking risks better and making sure that finance is pre-arranged. We need to collaborate and be prepared to continue to respond to the impacts of climate change. Um, so those three hold together. In my new role, I really want to listen to all generations, particularly those living on the front line of climate change, and to understand what we as the presidency need to do. On December the 12th, the UK, the UN and France are co-hosting the Climate Ambition Summit alongside our partners Italy and Chile on the fifth anniversary of our landmark Paris Agreement. So we're calling on all countries to bring high ambition commitments on mitigation, adaptation and resilience and finance, those three pillars that will help us really uh, crack the problem and get ahead of this. So the UK is really committed to mobilising action on ANR. We're preparing the UK's first adaptation communication under the UNFCCC, and we're encouraging other countries to come forwards with their own adaptation communications and plans, because that's going to be the, the base stop take from which we can all work. Great, thank you for setting that out so clearly for us, um, Anne-Marie. Nick, um, we've heard um, comments today that um, money is simply not flowing at the pace and scale needed and it won't unless the business case is made for investing in adaptation and resilience so um how clear is the business case well thanks Zainab, and good morning uh, everybody look i think this is one situation where the business case is absolutely clear i mean it's really obvious uh, that physical climate change represents the biggest single risk factor in the financial sector, and that's why TCFD has been developed. And you know, studies, respectable, respected studies indicate that 17% that of financial value could be at risk depending on the degree of climate change. So we have pause and think about that for a second. 17%, that is tens of trillions of dollars of people's savings and their pension funds, and not to mention the, 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 people's, li the people's lives and, and livelihoods. And, you know, we also know that almost every year economic losses from natural disasters and extreme climate events increase. And that's, a, that's only going to continue. So it's all, also inevitable that, in, that, that uh, investments that are resilient to those climate shocks are going to offer better long term returns, as well as obviously offer a better protecting livelihoods. So I think if we ask what we can do, and when I say what we can do, I don't just mean the development banks. I also mean sort of mainstream investment institutions. I think firstly, we've got to really ensure uh, that every investment we make factors in uh, climate risk and, and, and plans for resilience. And so it's got to be mainstream in every capital allocation decision we make. Um, and secondly, we've got to invest in solutions that increase resilience. And that's not just because it's the right thing to do, but in the same way as we made investments in wind and in solar a decade ago, we made them because there's a massive need and there's a, a, there's a significant financial opportunity as well. And the same situation is true today when we talk about adaptation and resilience. So for CDC, for other development banks, it's all about understanding and measuring climate change, planning for resilience in all our investments, and finding ways to invest in, in, in resilience interventions and solutions. Thanks very much indeed, Nick. Um, so um, Nisreen, um, Obviously, you're very focused on the African continent and you're, you represent the younger generation. And, you know, we heard Ban Ki-moon talk about a revolution in understanding so you can shift mindsets because it's not easy to think in terms of decades, but very important for the next generation. And just outline for us why adaptation is so important. I mean, we know in Africa there are millions of smallholder farmers who are really looking for more investment in agricultural research and development. But just give, give us your, your thoughts on, on the significance of this from your perspective. Um, thank you very much, Zainab. Um, 
I'm very happy to be here today and uh, let me um, um, join my colleagues in congratulating Anne-Marie and her new assignment. We are looking very much to work with you and um, with the, all of the champions of the COP26. Um, well, uh, as a start, uh, COP26 is um, somehow historical uh, moment and historical opportunity for UK and for many leading countries uh, to actually reach the point where um, not any other COP reached before. Um, now time is different, especially after the COVID-19, um, young people are more determined, more organized and more focused uh, than before. So I think um, we we were willing to work in cooperation with the with the COP26 uh, uh, staff and people. Uh, yet uh, I know they will have a very hard uh, job in front of them. Going back to the question of the adaptation, well, the, let me be honest and frank and say the way of formulating this question is what is putting us in a problem in the first place. Um, well. We have climate investment and we have climate finance that we don't know yet what is the definition of climate finance. And this is also taking us to another direction, but let me go back a little bit to the adaptation. Uh, so um, we are designed right now to think that only developing countries, especially African countries, need adaptation and only developed countries need mitigation. And that's why we have a lot of finance going to mitigation comparing to adaptation. And this is numbers uh, in the websites of the GCF, of the, of the adaptation uh, fund, uh, also of the di different climate envelopes that more uh, finance flow goes to mitigation than adaptation. Uh, well, actually, this is not true because we will reach a point where uh, mitigation is not enough anymore. We are already exceeding 1.1 Celsius degrees. And by the NDC submitted by countries, we will soon reach 3.5 degrees Celsius. I think not only us, but the whole world will need adaptation as much as Africa. The only thing that makes us more vulnerable is the lack of infrastructure, lack of uh, finance, lack of uh, capacity within our countries and within our continent actually to adapt right now with adaptation with the climate change. But I can give many examples of flash floods in Europe. I can give many examples of we uh, heat waves that Europe never witnessed before. Uh, many hurricanes started hitting North America, South America and different countries. Uh, so I think adaptation is not something for Africa alone. Yet Africa is the most impacted by uh, the, the, the climate change at the moment. Let me give you a small example of that. Um, in the floods we witnessed very a few weeks ago here in Sudan, uh, we had more than 800,000 uh, homeless, more than 17 million dollars was lost in, in capital, um, more than uh, 100,000 houses were completely destroyed and what breaks my heart more is when I visited the field, uh, when I visited uh, people who were actually got affected by the flood, I uh, figured out that more than a third of them are actually IDBs or actually refugees. Um, so these people were vulnerable to climate change twice. Most of our refugees in Sudan are actually um, uh, refugees because of conflict over natural resources and conflict caused by climate change. So they uh, they displaced internally or uh, they moved from one area to another and then again a flood heated their houses and then they again had to move and stay in a camp. So I think we will be we will be affected not only twice but hundreds of times because of of, uh, of climate change. Thank you so much indeed, Nisreen, for putting the case so powerfully that adaptation is important for all parts of the world, the global north, the global south, but also reminding us about how people in Africa are bearing the brunt. And you mentioned the floods in the Sudan, and of course. You see the repercussions because waterborne diseases, even once the floods recede, are causing a great deal of, of, of problems for health in the country. So, um, Nick, um, listening to Nisreen making that uh, extremely powerful case yeah. for adaptation, it really does put pressure on organisations like CDC. We know solutions are needed. We have some solutions, but we really need to encourage them and to really, you know, scale 
these solutions. Mm. So how can we do that, Nick? Mm. Yeah, so look, I think Nizreen put it really very powerfully, and you're absolutely right, that scale and speed are really critical here. And I think what we have to start by remembering is that solutions to adaptations are going to come from many different places. You know, some of them will come from big multinational companies and will, those companies will have lots of capital to develop them. But many of them, and particularly those in developing markets and particularly in places like Sudan, those are going to be local solutions. They're going to be local entrepreneurs. They're going to be small companies. They're going to be innovators, use, innovative users of, of technology. And I think all those companies are going to need capital to innovate and to grow. And that's really the critical function of, of, of the development banks. Um, and, you know, Nazreen is, Nazreen is absolutely right about a lot of more money has gone into mitigation than adaptation and resilience. But I think we are at CDC beginning to be encouraged because we're seeing more of an increase in, you know, funds specializing in adaptation and resilience. We're seeing more opportunities to perhaps invest in things like drip irrigation, which help to use water and nutrients more, more efficiently. We're seeing more opportunities to invest in, in software startups that help farmers get better weather intelligence so they can better use input, track inputs and, and yields, more ideas for wastewater treatment and, and recycling. So I think we are seeing a lot more sort of idea flow and opportunities and entrepreneurs really focusing on this on this area. Um, but we are going to, if we're going to really develop those and help develop those, we're going to, there's a lot to do and we're going to need to collaborate. We're going to need to work together to get funding to the right places and the places where it makes the most difference. And that's going to mean development finance. It's going to mean concessional capital. It's going to mean, it's going to mean grants um, uh, if we're going to really accelerate the growth of these businesses and try to really start to solve this problem and to protect those lives and livelihoods. Mm. And uh, I mean, the, the needle is beginning to move, isn't it? I mean, we hear very much how um, the president of the African Development Bank, Dr. Kina Desina, has said that now the bank is totally focused on adaptation when it comes to climate change um, in Africa. So uh, Anne-Marie, we've heard Nick O'Donoghue there from CDC outline, you know, where they think the um, opportunities are to encourage and scale solutions. But what will help? CDC and indeed others make those crucial investments in a and R um, adaptation and resilience. Just ex you know, outline for us what those critical interventions are. So I think absolutely critically, and I think uh, Ms. Reen says that so well. We must listen and hear the voices of the vulnerable countries. Their adaptation needs will depend upon that local context that Nick highlighted some of them. So we need to support the development of those local solutions with local partners. I think the challenge at the moment is that very often these aren't ready at a scale that works for investors. So we need collaboration between public and private sectors. So from governments, we want to see national adaptation plans that really articulate the need and also policy and regulation formulation that will create local markets for adaptation solutions. And that's the case, you know, here in the UK through to some of our most, most vulnerable countries, that affects all of us. We need to be thinking in that space. The public development banks, especially local ones, will need to focus on market barriers and piloting innovative financial solutions that can increase that private sector investment. Donors need to support with grant funding or seed capital for those novel businesses. And we need to look at risk transfer solutions like insurance to cover unexpected losses and more widespread understanding of risk to focus markets on developing solutions that will genuinely make a difference. It's not just about investment in specific adaptation resilience services and products though. All investments must be resilient. Resilient roads, resilient bridges. So that means taking into account the climate driven risks that might be faced in the future. Hence the need for those adaptation plans now to really understand what those are so that all future investment really is thinking resilient. So the UK is scaling up support. Last year, Prime Minister Boris Johnson committed to doubling our international climate finance spend to £11.6 billion between 2021 and 2025. And today, the hosts of Financing Commons Summit, the upcoming Climate Adaptation Summit and COP26 commit to a greater action and collaboration to achieve three really important outcomes. Firstly, greater understanding and implementation of common approaches to definitions, monitoring and evaluation, to drive resilience across all investments. And secondly, deeper collaboration to create markets for A&R solutions 
by using grant funding and other financial instruments. And third, enhanced efforts to place climate resilience centrally to COVID recovery. So next, we want to invite others to work together with us to create an ambitious and transformative set of commitments in time for the Global Centre on Adaptions Climate Adaptation Summit in January. Thanks very much indeed. And um, Nick, final word to you as I wrap this panel and uh, just briefly, how are CDC and colleagues going to take all this forward? Okay. Well, so today we say, so please join us, please join us in, in uh, trying to achieve uh, work on the priorities that the three priorities that that Anne Marie outlined. Then there's going to be a series of working sessions on those three priorities uh, leading up to COP26. Uh, and you know the next key step, the next key milestone, as Anne Marie said, is the global 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 climate adaptation summit in on, on January the 25th. All right, thanks very much indeed, um, Nick, and thank you to you, Anne Marie Trevelyan, and also Nasreen in Khartoum, Sudan. Well, um, it's not all doom and gloom, though, because, you know, we as the case for adaptation resilience, um, you know, is, is, is gaining momentum, we are actually seeing some solutions. And so we're going to play this film now to hear about how the private and public sectors in particular are coming together in taking action and the kind of solutions that are already being pursued. So if we could play our final film, please. Thank you. Sirens alert communities of imminent flooding. Farmers grow drought-resistant crops as poor rainfall dries the land. And roofs are painted white to deflect the heat. The world is taking concrete steps in financing initiatives to respond to the challenges of adaptation and resilience. There are clear examples of how governments, public development banks and the private sector are coming together to mobilise finance and accelerate action. And the Global Centre on Adaptation believes COVID-19 presents a watershed moment to do this. We have to invest in climate adaptation now. Why? Because it provides a triple dividend. It's good for the climate, it's good for the economy, and it's good for our health. That's precisely what the Global Centre on Adaptation is doing. We're investing and scaling adaptation action across the globe with a specific focus on Africa. We're working with the African Development Bank and the African Adaptation Initiative to support the continent's leadership. This is the time to build forward better. Africa, which accounts for a tiny fraction of total carbon emissions, welcomes this greater global attention on adaptation and resilience. And the African Development Bank is stepping up its commitments. Prioritizing resilience in Africa is therefore an imperative. Accordingly, the international community must pay more attention to resilience building, which also makes economic sense, considering that investments in resilience are projected to yield benefit to cost ratios of between 2 to 1 and 10 to 1. Access to climate finance to, at scale is key to building resilience in Africa. This is an area ideally suited for public development banks intervention. This year alone, Africa needs 7 to 15 billion to address its climate impacts in addition to the 114 billion to deal with economic impacts of COVID-19. Yet, only 57 billion has been mobilized for the continent to date. On its part, the Africa Development Bank has made excellent progress with regard to climate finance. In order to generate more funds, multilateral banks are using innovative financial instruments. The EBRD, for instance, has issued the first ever Climate Resilience Bond. We are proud of the $67 billion of financing for climate resilience that the multilateral development banks, including EBRD, have provided over the past decade. However, this is not sufficient. Instead, we need to raise our ambition and unlock the potential of financial markets. And multilateral institutions, such as the EBRD, can play a vital, catalytic role. Last year, the EBRD issued the first ever climate resilience bond, raising $700 million from capital markets for climate resilience investments 
across our region. And we intend to replicate these issuances on a regular basis. With this experience, we stand ready to work alongside others to build a marketplace for innovative financing instruments, such as the mentioned Climate Resilience Bond. And we are delighted to work alongside the Global Centre on Adaptation and the Climate Bonds Initiative to further this important area of financial innovation. The private sector is showing strong leadership, such as through the newly launched CCRI, the Public-Private Sector Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment. CCRI is an organization composed of over 50 uh, public and private member organizations from across the value chain that are interested in addressing climate resilient investment. These projects will generate optimum climate risk adjustment returns in both the developed world and in emerging economies. So in this way, CCRI will generate and mobilize client smart capital that will produce more resilient investments, more resilient assets that will protect lives, livelihoods, and incomes for exposed population both in the years and the decades to come. In 2017, the INSU Resilience Global Partnership for Climate and Disaster Risk Finance and Insurance was created to bring together countries, civil societies, international organisations, the private sector and academia to help vulnerable communities. Under the Intro Resilience Global Partnership, we have been supporting programmes in over 75 countries with more than half a billion euros to scale up climate and disaster risk finance and insurance solutions embedded in comprehensive risk management. With our Vision 2025, the joint work plan of all partnership members, we want to provide protection for 500 million poor and vulnerable people by 2025. The partnership has built strong alliances with the private sector and the insurance development forum, with uh, represents key stakeholders from the insurance and reinsurance industry. In order to meet the increased demand for our partners, I'm happy to announce that Germany is increasing its funding for the Intro Resilience Solution Fund by another 10 million euros for the next two years. This will allow us to expand the support for innovative and high-impact risk financing solutions. Alliances between the public and insurance sectors are already delivering results in disaster risk management. Insurance companies are concretely developing projects. They are financing open source risk modeling tools and co-investing with BMZ in the financing of the technical assistance program. They also maintain their offer of 5 billion US dollars in risk capacity. Concrete results have already been delivered. We've launched our first project to create a flood and earthquake insurance program for Peru's public schools. This has the potential to provide coverage for up to 50,000 schools and will incorporate Build Back Better standards into reconstruction. It will also leverage innovative image recognition technologies as a key part of managing these public assets. It also sets the course for securing other public assets such as hospitals, bridges and roads. The Insurance Development Forum is a public-private partnership led by the insurance industry and supported by international organizations, including the World Bank and the United Nations. Our aim is to extend the use of insurance and related risk management capacities to support resilience building and also provide protection for people, communities, businesses, public institutions that are vulnerable to disasters and associated economic shocks. We are committed to the Insure Resilience Vision 2025 and the objective to provide insurance coverage for 500 million people by 2025. As part of this endeavor, we are also committed to supporting the provision of better risk information, which is central to the work of the insurance industry. We are also committed to working across both the public and the private sector to develop new kinds of innovative disaster risk financing tools that will help us to support response to these events in a much more reliable and cost-effective way. 
Successful adaptation needs to reduce the vulnerability of farmers and requires greater efficiency in the use of water. And the AFD is announcing a new coalition for this. As described by the IPCC, the greatest risks of global warming relate to water. Water resources are under pressure. Billions of people are lacking proper access to water and sanitation with impact on health, economy and the environment. The COVID-19 pandemic is a brutal reminder of the need for such basic services. As water drives resilient countries, we are calling all public development banks, whether multilateral, bilateral or national, to develop financing for water and sanitation and to foster cooperation among them. A working group will be launched during the Finance in Common Summit and we are inviting all PDBs to join us in order to build a water finance coalition. We count on you. And the Dutch government, in collaboration with FMO, its development bank, is urging greater collaboration and cooperation on climate adaptation. COVID-19, climate change and conflict force us to think in a new way about development. The post-COVID recovery should better resist future shocks and enhance resilience, while putting the most vulnerable first and bringing us closer to achieving the SDGs and the goals of the Paris Agreement. Investing in climate adaptation supports this through enhancing resilience and reducing inequalities. The Dutch government puts climate adaptation high on its agenda. I want to share two examples with you. First, the Dutch Fund for Climate and Development. It finances business opportunities for climate adaptation in vulnerable landscapes. And second example, January 25, the Netherlands will host the Climate Adaptation Summit with the ambition to inspire larger investments from private and public actors worldwide in climate adaptation. You're welcome to participate and to contribute. Today's event marks a renewed commitment for greater collaboration ahead of the Climate Adaptation Summit in January 2021. As countries look forward to rebuilding after the COVID-19 pandemic, Recovery plans in this decisive decade must include more investment and real action on climate adaptation and resilience. So the uh, collection of voices you heard there ending with the Dutch Ambassador for Sustainable Development with that save the date January the 25th for that uh, summit on climate adaptation. And I think we saw there some real concrete examples of just how funds and resources are being mobilised to accelerate adaptation and resilience, but not at the pace and scale that is needed. That ends this high level event on accelerating investment in, in adaptation and resilience. It's been my great pleasure to um, host um, this event. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you to all of you who've been um, joining us. And uh, we move on to the next uh, major milestone in this in 2021. But for now, from me, Zain Badawi, thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Oh, that's, uh, <laughs> <we are> right. <laughs> that's a professional <laughs> came out on time with a minute to spare i didn't want to go to the end. And perfect and nick thank you very much indeed for keeping